morning, everyone. It's Julie Livingston, Want Leverage Communications, and I'm thrilled to be back for another edition of PR Patter, my weekly podcast where I speak to marketing and public relations experts from across my network and beyond. Um, I am so thrilled today to welcome Melissa Bella Williamson. She's an accredited, internationally recognized public relations expert, national industry columnist, podcast host and author with two decades of multicultural and integrated communications experience. Melissa serves as a consultant, trainer, and account director at her boutique PR firm, MVW Communications. She has directed communications initiative for more than 100 brands over the course of her career and with unique experience in internal communications and DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion in that sector, Melissa leverages her PR expertise and acumen as a certified diversity professional to create social good. Her book, Smart Talk, here's a copy of it, which is terrific, um, was published in October 2022 and quickly became an Amazon bestseller. Go, Melissa. So for more information on her services, go to mbw360.com and welcome to the broadcast, Melissa. I'm so glad that we could do this today. Um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we call it DEI in our, in our business, has become, it's such a hot topic right now. And we're seeing it in the workplace trying to call, you know, where companies are trying to carve out opportunities for women, creating a pathway to leadership positions for women, but also from people, for people from diverse backgrounds, including sexual orientation. And so all of this has come to affect the way we communicate, the way companies communicate to their employees and other key stakeholder groups. It's a tricky it's a, a slippery slope, let's put it that way. And companies really need to get it right. We've certainly seen so many that don't get it right or really, you know, hit some bumps along the way. Talk a little bit about um, the importance of inclusiveness and in communications today and why it's finally, finally on the radar of companies and brands. Yeah, thank you, Julie. First, thank you for having me. I'm I'm delighted to be your guest and have this conversation with you. You know, I it pains me that this is still seems like such a novelty or it's finally on the radar. Uh, I'll I'll be very forthcoming and say throughout my career, which is two decades now, the popularity of diversity and inclusion and now equity um, just kind of ebbs and flows. Right. And for a lot of us in the communication space, I've seen some awakening, particularly after um, um, the Black Lives Matter movement and whatnot. But hey, I'm in Texas. So literally this morning in the newspaper, which I consume every day, um, I read in the newspaper that, you know, our governor is trying to do away with some DEI initiatives uh, in public um, entities, universities and whatnot. So there has been this push pull dynamic probably forever. And where it comes from, in my opinion, is that, you know, we're still wired. Yes, we've evolved as humans over these years, but our brain is still wired to look for safety, right? And part of that is that we've got that tribal mindset. Like we want to belong to a group and, and we've got cave people brains that are still looking for, am I part of this group or that group? You're different than yeah. me. Is that safe? That's kind of the basis of where all this angst comes from. And we're a lot living, of we're living in such a polarized polarized society now. Um, politics are just so yeah. emotionally charged. People are saying that they can't even be friends anymore with people who have different political viewpoints um, mm -hmm. than that than they do. I mean, it's a really intense time. You know, it is, but it also isn't. Julie. So here's what I want to share. And this is why I'm delighted to be talking with you about this topic is that I do a lot of research about diversity and inclusion um, and underneath that culture and how people think what they value, which drives how they operate. Right. So if we understand human motivation and behavior, we'll be much better communicators because we can move with what drives people. 
And I will tell you, I, I look up research a lot of times from Pew Research Center. And by and large, if we're just talking about the U.S., uh, those of us in the U.S., most people live right in that middle. It's really a case by case basis on how we pick and choose who we vote for, sometimes even when and how people, you know, choose to align with a brand or an organization, whether or not they vote, get engaged, get vaccinated, right? What we hear are the extremes and the louds in our society. That's that is true. That is and our true. job as communicators is to make sure that the silent, unheard, quieter midstream mm -hmm. voices are heard because we are the mainstream. And that's the big aha for a lot of people is that, well, why are you getting into the space of intersecting diversity, equity, and inclusion principles with PR principles? Because if you just looked at it by numbers, the U.S. is more multicultural than ever. Our last U.S. census results, and that's with an undercount. A lot of people did not identify. It was a pretty tricky time. Uh, with the president who was um, at the helm at that point to come out, especially if you were in the Latino community and, and necessarily raise your hand to put in that data, right? There was a lot of question marks about that. But with that, uh, even with the undercount for those who did report, we're more of a multicultural society than ever. Yeah. For the first time in history, the white population, those who identified, right? Because we're all selecting those boxes when it comes down to it. Uh, those who identify as white, that population decreased. In states like Texas, there's no longer a Hispanic minority, right? Yeah, we're exactly right. even. So when we're just looking at terminology, the U.S. Census dropped the use of majority minority as a noun, right? If we were talking about the number of people or a group, we might say the majority of people, but we wouldn't say minorities anymore. And so I'm watching and monitoring public sentiment, but also terminology and how that's being used. Because as we change, as people evolve and become more multi-identified, we're going. Some things are going to resonate with us that are new, and some things are going to no longer work for us that you know we've been doing for a long time. So, as PR pros and communicators, we have got to continue to tailor our approach, our strategies, our messaging, the channel usage based on who we're working with today and who those people will be tomorrow. And I'll tell you, it's a plus society. And um, we all have multiple parts of our, you know, being in our identity. And so we have to find the parts that resonate with people. And so I do focus on inclusion um, amongst all these things, because that's where most people uh, really feel like that change is made. When you make people feel like they belong, well, that's the top value around the world. Everybody wants to belong. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been doing research myself on belonging on court. You know, I write a lot um, for C-level executives. I, I strategize on their LinkedIn content and do their ghostwriting and belonging is one of the most um, important topics I, that we get so much traction on, especially on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, audiences want to feel that they belong to an organization or a particular group within their, the company that they work for. Because and, and that is such a, a key factor in motivation and ultimately productivity uh, and engagement. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so you just talked about this a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate. In your book, um, you present a Venn diagram. Remember those Venn diagrams from school? Yeah. Um, which illustrates the intersection of PR and DEI communications. Can you explain that in further depth for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually have two different models in the book, and I absolutely was inspired by Jeannie Dietrich's PESO model. I'll say that because sometimes, it, it, and we know this as communicators, right? Sometimes you just need to make an infographic for people to get it. Yeah, love PESO. Um, <laughs> we're visual beings, and you know, like like Jeannie's, I thought, well, let me just show how these work together. So. I will release the Venn diagram on my blog officially next month when we do a sneak peek of chapter six. But if you can see it here, Great. it's on page 144. And it's in the chapter about tailoring for multicultural needs. And so essentially, Julie, I'm showing you, look, if you are doing public relations in a proactive, intentional way, then that means you're focused on building relationships. You're focused on ethical advising. You're doing strategic marketing communications, which is 
multi-channel, uh, tailored messages for those channels and the different cultural groups on those channels and how they behave, right? And then DEI principles like appreciating and leveraging differences, uh, providing resources to bridge any gaps and shore up needs, which is equity. And then inclusion, like you said, Julie, welcoming and including. And we certainly don't want to tolerate people. We want to respect them. And, and that's where I'm pushing our industry to think a little differently, right? But when you do both sides of those um, communication you know, approaches, right, it intersects naturally to make better, stronger relationships. It builds goodwill. That helps build sustainability for businesses because people are changing and we have got to evolve our organizations and our communications show and illustrate who our organizations are to be more aligned with, with uh, people and what they care about. But that also helps with reputation management and avoiding totally. issues. Mm -hmm. I, I have found um, in my work that, um, and perhaps you have too, that one of the things that um, really helps with developing stakeholder relationships and making sure that communications is in alignment with their needs is when the human resource department and the public relations or communications and marketing department collaborate and kind of work together. Um, because the HR team has a certain perspective of the people, right? And who's being hired and who's on the team and what, you know, um, what their attitudes are, what their engagement level is, et cetera. And then the communications team knows about how to kind of develop that messaging so that it's in alignment? Well, let me add to that. So I worked inside of a corporation and the larger the corporation and the larger the employee base, the more likely you are to have separate departments. And so I talk a lot about moving forward in this concept of integrated marketing comm to not only integrating the parts that we think about externally, but internal comms, right? And, and employee first type plans. We have to build those brand advocates and build belief from the employees who illustrate what we do and what we care about as an organization, but also integrating with DEI because I, those corporations often have a communications department and then that's usually internal comms or maybe benefits comms or HR comms, right? Then you have human resources. Then you have public affairs or public relations, the external comms. Then you have advertising and marketing in their own department. They do not often work together. And a lot right. of the work I do as a consultant is bringing together different departments and say, we should plan this yeah. together. And what does that look like in your world? And can we make space for it on social? Can we make space for it in the employee newsletter? Um, where would this best be served up? Um, but then DEI is often on an island all by themselves. And then a lot of organizations, DEI professionals or that department is going to be more closely aligned with human resources. And let's be honest, human resources are often in place to protect the organization, right? Not always the employees. Uh, that was certainly my lived experience. And it's also been other types of experiences that I, I've researched and learned about. Right. So yeah. that was really tough for me when I worked in a DNI department in a corporation was that there was a lot of things that I thought, I think I was just a little ahead of my time a couple of years. I've noticed that about me. I'm a kind of a pace setter, which isn't always comfortable. Um, but I'll say that, you know, having these big ideas to really make change, there's times where our organizations are not ready for it. Um, but it's our job to keep having them make those educated choices. Yeah, and, and actually ask the tough questions. Yes. I mean, whenever you prepare anybody in an organization, uh, you know, for... Um, whatever they're doing, whether it's writing a memo or sending an email blast or giving a presentation or setting up a new uh, employee initiative, you you know, it's our role as yeah. communications specialists to pose those, those tough questions and make sure that the people who are sending out those messages are doing it the right way and are comfortable in doing it. Talk a little bit about mm -hmm. um, authenticity because I do find that some companies are better at dealing, you know, addressing the DEI, um, certainly the inclusiveness issue better than others, because it really has to come from the top yeah. and it has to really be embedded in the culture. Yeah, and that's very, very tough because organizations are made of people and people are flawed, right? 
which is why PR Some people are putting out. <laughs> no, we're all are, right? In fact, I, I remember I was telling my husband just this morning, you know, we always, everyone talks about their lived experiences and their families and, and their mother and their father. And there's always jokes about that. But, you know, I'm a mother. And I say, you know, I, I hope that one day my kids aren't saying X, Y, Z about me, but I am flawed. And so I expect some of my mistakes will come up. Uh, but that's the way our organizations are too, right? So yeah. the authenticity for me, it's what can you do in this space that is aligned with your organizational values and is sustainable? And so many people made these commitments in recent years that now those of us who are kind of watching and measuring for that are noticing, hey, you didn't fulfill that commitment. You didn't right. walk through that path that you set out. And so it's really about, you know, the, the, some of the origin principles of PR that Arthur Page has, right? Those seven principles. One of them is like, you know, building trust is a matter of not just saying something, but actually following up and doing it. So sometimes it's these little bitty baby steps that we can take that make all the difference. One of them, which Julie is representation. How do you actually Absolutely. show? Are you walking the talk? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. sometimes it's so easy, right? There's there's a lot of low hanging fruit in this space. So part of it is visuals. Like, when's the last time you looked at your marketing photos? Is that photo library representative of actual customers or students? Right. What are the optics? Yes. What are the real the optics of what you know of of your initiative? Yeah, you know, I was reading a book to my son just the other night, and this hit me like a ton of bricks, and I felt pretty bad about it as a person, but just more about where our society's at. I'm just reading him a book about a little girl in the book who's writing thank you letters to everyone. And she wrote a thank you letter to her teacher. And the illustrator drew a, a male, black male teacher. And I, my brain went, oh, different. Before, it, my unconscious brain did that before my conscious brain said, wow, right. why are you recognizing that as different, right? And, but I appreciate that illustrator and that author and that publisher from going, we're going to make, you're just, we're just going to change that narrative in our small way by showing, right, what we want to see more of in this world, for example, as I know there's a big call to action from even nationally, like my brother's keeper and, and there's different organizations in my market that are looking for more male teachers, men of color to teach, right? Because there's so much power in knowing someone like you who's doing role something. modeling. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So sometimes as communicators, the images we use, the talent, you know, that we put up in our stock photos that we make for our organization, like don't go online and get stock photos, take photos of real life mentors and volunteers and teachers and whatnot so that people see themselves and know someone and connect to that story better. Um, the words we use, just being more careful and thoughtful about them. And, um, you know, that that runs a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum of DEI. And I, I believe in the middle. I'm looking for majority consensus because you're not going to make everyone happy. Number one in this right. world. And number two, when it comes to DEI right. or a more inclusive type of comms, but you're looking for tailoring for your stakeholders, for your target publics, who you want to connect with. And then you research them and even ask them, right? What channels do you like? What programs would resonate with you? Uh, what makes you feel like you belong and are a part and respected in this organization? Asking really matters because that's so much great data that you can do something good with. So let me ask you this. How can companies sort of take a DEI audit mm. um, to sort of to get started. And again, to take baby steps toward um, toward really making a difference and positioning themselves well. Yeah. And I will say like, look, it, it's just like communication planning and strategic planning. Like there's two very different um, things we're talking about here. So DEI audit may have to do with the makeup of your organization who's in that C-suite room, who's on your board, right? Who are the real influencers within the organization um, and can make that kind of change. Um, and so that's kind of the people or human resources approach. And then there's the actual communication approach, right? Where we're looking at the terminology, the copy, the messaging, the visuals, right? What we're actually uh, promoting here. And so the DEI comms approach, like 
you know, there's there's tools for that and frameworks for that, and I can work with clients on that. But essentially, it's just really looking through visuals, copy, um, and thinking about diversity more than just skin color or what we see. So uh, we want to respect diversity in terms of education. Julie, most of the people, and this is just nationally based, right? But most of the piece, people in the U.S. don't have a bachelor's degree or above. So right. about 70% of those in the U.S. do not. That means about 30% and a lot of communicators who are in professional roles do have their bachelor's or above. So you're talking about a smaller subset, right? of the U.S. who is writing for and about and to those who don't have that same education level. So are we even appreciating educational diversity within our stakeholders or our employee group, for example? So you're trying to be too smart in your writing or your communication peoples and people don't understand, like, can we bring it down? Can we be more literal? Can we be easier to approach and understand? So there's a lot of different pieces and I sure write a, a lot about them. So if anyone it's curious. I'm sure some of my Good. columns for PRSA actually has about that. And of course, I talk about these things in the book. No, that's great. What what, what companies do you think are doing it right? Oh, gosh. I sure hate to put a stamp on that. I'll say um, I can name like company who's trying right? Because I think doing That's it good. Right yeah. is very, very tough because by whose standards, right? Yeah. Um, but I'll say that I really like the attempts and the efforts that I see like the Disney company trying to do. And again, they're not going to make everyone happy. Um, and they've got a lot, just like any other organization with history that no longer works today. And they've tried to make amends for it, but that makes other groups upset, right? But I would say the majority, that mainstream, those theme parks are full. Those movies are watched. I like the efforts that they're making and having more heroes with different backgrounds of different mm-hmm. colors. Yeah. We're um, seeing that a lot. Yeah, yeah, which is great. They're making that effort. And I think that it's as, it's making people question, why am I reacting to that? So, for example, the live action Little Mermaid's coming out. And I'm excited to see it. And I know um, it's really interesting, the conversations that I've had and I've seen online and had with others about, well, why did they pick, you know, for Ariel, the Little Mermaid, to be a different skin color or tone than what the original drawing was? That can be very hard for people because you read a storybook, you watch a, a film, and let's just take like any ugliness out of it. It's different. And so you're asking us not to exactly take what we saw in animation and make it literally right. the same. So, not to replicate it. Yeah. So if we yeah. just put the motion out of it or, or, you know, feelings of racism, if we're just thinking of that way, there was a reaction. But I think there was intentionality for why they did that. And having us question and say, why can't we change this up? It was a drawing, right? Or maybe the majority of drawings back then were like this. Um, so I like the effort that they're making and I appreciate that. And um, they're not always going to be, you know, that's not going to make everyone happy, but I think they are evolving with society. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And they really do set the tone for so much of the entertainment industry um, and certainly the toy industry. So it is going to be really <laughs> interesting. To, I used to be yeah. in that business. Yeah. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens as a result of that film's release anyway. Yeah. And, you know, and I've seen some um, black focused organizations, black community organizations, like uh, there's one called the Lemonade Circle. I'm so sorry if I got that wrong, but I'm seeing your logo. Yeah, yeah. We're in San Antonio that they're having um, a fundraiser around it for their girls. They serve a lot. Isn't that great? Yeah. Black girls in the community. And so when the Warrior King came out, like we went and saw it. And I thought that was one of the most inspiring, empowering films I've ever seen in my life as a woman, um, brought my daughter to it and color had nothing to do with it. Right. I identified strongly with the female character. So every day there's different points where the, the dominant factor of our culture or identity piece is going to come out in us. Right. Maybe today you really feel like PR pro, or you really feel like a mother or a parent, or it's really about being a good partner, whatever that is for you. It's interesting to see if you put yourself in different environments and dynamics, it gets you really thinking about them more consciously. So I appreciate the comments. It's all added into the public discourse on this topic, which is yeah. is really, it's so important. Absolutely. Melissa, this has been such a great conversation. I've learned a ton and I recommend 
Melissa's book, Smart Talk. So go out and get your copy if you haven't read it already. And I hope you'll come back again so that we can continue this conversation. I would love to, Julie. And I, I look forward to having you on my Smart Talk series podcast soon. Great. Thanks so much. Everyone, see you next time on another episode of PR Pattern.